up. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mrs. Mello, roll call. Councilor Souza. Present. Councilor Mello. Present. Councilor Lambert. Present. Councilor De Medeiros. Present. Councilor Perry, Councilor Shabbat, and Councilor Pelletier absent at this time. Thank you. At this point, I'd like Andy Tice to take over. Thank you. Okay, testing. Testing? No? Pardon me? Oh, it's not hooked up. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, then, fine. I'm gonna okay, and well, I guess I'll use this as well. Um, and this will give me a little bit of room to work. Um, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think everybody knows me, but I'm Andy Tights. I'm town solicitor here in Tiverton. And we're here tonight to talk about really interesting, fascinating stuff, such as uh, your service in the public interest, uh, open meetings, public records, and ethics. Um, but I'm going to do my best to try to make it somewhat interesting. Um, and it is important. It's something important that we do, I do, but most importantly, you all do. And most of you here do this as volunteers. You don't get paid for it. You spend your time. You come to these meetings. You come to meetings to watch what's going on. You come to the meetings of, of your boards and commissions and do all this work. Um, and it's important. And it's important because I think we all have to remember um, that those of us here in the room are the unusual ones who go to town meetings, who are interested in government, involved in government. Most of the people don't have contact with their government. They certainly don't have it with their federal government other than their federal taxes, and not really with their state government, and they don't have much contact usually even with their municipal government. Again, when they come in to pay their taxes, perhaps, um, when they come in to vote, but other than that, they don't have much contact until suddenly they get a letter in the mail saying there's a zoning hearing, their neighbor's applying for something. Um, or they want to go put a deck on and they find, oh, I can't get it without going to the zoning board. Or there's a zoning change amendment. And maybe it's for a big project and it conceivably is going to have a big impact on their neighborhood. And so these people come here and this is their only contact with the American government is when they come to your meeting. For many people, that's their only contact. So how they feel about how they were treated and how it went on in your meeting makes a big difference to what their view is about the government as a whole. I know it's kind of a heavy responsibility, but you are representatives of the man, the government, to many of these people. So it is important how they're treated um, and how you act. And how you act is you're acting in the public interest. Um, it's something, what is the public interest? It's something that benefits the whole welfare of the community. You're not just concerned with the people, the applicant that is in front of you, not even just the applicant and if there are 25 or 50 objectors. That's not just the public. It's the entire public. It's the town. And sometimes it's even the citizens of the state of Rhode Island. And you're looking to see what their interests are. You have to apply these larger standards and ask who's going to benefit from what you do. Is it going to be an individual? Is it going to be a group? Is it going to be at the expense of the public? Does the public benefit? How do you balance that? And that's why what you do is important and what you need to think about. And first and foremost about how you do it is acting within your legal authority. The state of Rhode Island delegates the power 
via the Constitution and the state statutes to the town, and then the town delegates that through the charter and the code of ordinances to the public bodies. That's you. And I'm just going to kind of use that general public body term, talk about all the different boards and commissions. I know we have a lot of overlap here, and we have some uh, employees here, staff, et cetera. We get a lot of people um, all dealing with that. And um, with that authority comes limitations and guidelines. Um, and if you exceed your authority, um, a lot of unpleasant things can happen to the town um, and to you personally, as well as to the people before you. Um, I find it um, interesting that many violations happen because someone on a board or commission wants to do a favor or help someone who is before them. They want to help an applicant. And this can be for different reasons. Sometimes it may be just a pure quid pro quo of a bribe type thing. That's why they want to do them a favor. <laughs> Sometimes it's a personal friendship. Sometimes it's just, yeah, I think this is the right thing for the town. This is a good idea. So what if we didn't really get the notice correct? This is a good thing for the town. We want it to happen. We're going to make this happen. Let's, let's, let's you know, do them a favor and keep moving, not postpone it for a whole other month. Um, and that's not a good idea because if it doesn't comply, if your action doesn't comply with all legal requirements, and I'm talking particularly more so with the planning and the zoning board where you're granting decisions and granting approvals, if it doesn't comply or with the council, if it's a zoning amendment, for example, or issuing a license, in any of those circumstances, if it doesn't comply, you actually usually end up hurting the applicant that you were trying to do the favor for. For whatever reason, whether it was a good or a bad reason that you were doing a favor for them, <laughs> you end up hurting them because they have to start all over. Um, at worst, the project can never be built, and there might be criminal sanctions. At best, it's being going to be delayed. So don't try to do somebody a favor. If it involves the law and procedures and following your things, don't try to do anybody a favor by saying, oh, it's OK, we can just go ahead and do that. Now, as I go forward, if you have any questions, please um, don't hesitate to interrupt me, put up your hand. If I don't notice your hand, cough, speak, yell out, anything short of throwing something, um, speak up. That's what we're here for tonight. If, if I only talk for five minutes and the rest of the time is spent on your questions, it'll still be a success. So don't hesitate to ask those questions. Um, and I just want, as I'm thinking about it again, I, I didn't introduce myself for very much, but because I, I think a lot of you know me, I've been around for a while, but I'll, for those of you who don't too, I want you to know I, our law firm represents five different towns, and we have for over 20 years in places. So I've spent a lot of time on that side of the table, but in the other 34 cities and towns, I've represented applicants and developers, you know, ranging from a little old lady who wants to get her two-family two home converted to a three-family home to major institutions such as Fortune 500 com companies and Brown University. So I've been on that side of the table also. And I was involved with the General Assembly in drafting the enabling legislation for the zoning and the planning laws. So I've seen it from all sides, although clearly my perspective tonight is from your side, the municipal side. So let's look at the key thing about your legal responsibilities. Um, it's a phrase called due process. Um, and it's one of those things that I'm sure you've heard thrown around a lot. Um, due process is one of those key phrases. Oh, this is a denial of due process. Well, what is due process? Basically, it's the process that protects both the rights of the individual, the applicant that's before you, and what we talked about at the very beginning, the rights of the public. And components of this are notice and an opportunity to be heard, time limits, standards of review, rules of procedure. The real thing that due process is is fairness. Is this fair? And if you can ask yourself the question, would a fair-minded person who just walked in the door and saw this happening, would they believe that this decision was made on the evidence before them on a fair and impartial basis, that's due process. There are specific 
components of it, procedural due process and substantive due process. And I'm not going to give you a big law school lecture on that, other than to say procedural due process is really more of what we're concerned with tonight. And that's making sure that you've done the process correctly, that you've posted your meetings, that you've provided notice to people, that you provide an opportunity to be heard, and you provide this fairness. If there's some sort of conflict of interest, you've recused yourself. Um, that's the issue most on the due process that we're talking about here. There's a second element of substantive due process, which is concerned with the fairness and the objectiveness of the result of the process. And that's really more of a specific topic, which I guess if we get to it, if we have time, we can talk about it. But that's more like applying the specific standards that boards and commissions do and making findings of fact. And that's a whole other three and a half hour session. So I'm not going to go too much into that. And talk about what we're really talking about is procedural due process. So overall in Rhode Island, when you look at due process stuff and these issues, there's three key statutes and uh, sets of laws that control. One is the Open Meetings Act. That governs all meetings of public bodies, and we're going to talk about the details there. The second one is called the Access to Public Records Act. Sometimes you just see it as that, um, the initials, APRA, Access to Public Records Act, that talks about the open meetings are what you're saying. People get to come and see and hear what you're saying. The Public Records Act is people have the right to certain documents and records that you're using. Um, and the third element is the Ethics Commission rules. In Rhode Island, we do have a sort of unusual aspect of government in that we have a three and a half branches of government or four branches of government, perhaps, with the Ethics Commission. They are a separate body set up by the Constitution. Um, there's statutes governing them, and they've also got the power to enact their own regulations, which they have. And they also have a whole variety of rules and regulations as to their efforts to make sure that this process is fair and ethical, that there's not either actually or perception decisions being made on a personal basis or favors or personal gain as opposed to objectively looking at the evidence before you when you're in these meetings. Um, so those are the three things. You'll sometimes hear people talk about FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act. The Freedom of Information Act is the name for the federal act, which is very similar and actually more similar now to the Public Records Act. Um, if someone's talking, you say, oh, I'm going to get that. I'm going to do a Freedom of Information request. All that means is that's the public records they're looking for. We call it Access to Public Records. Federal government calls it Freedom of Information Act. Uh, but same thing in concept. So I'm going to ask any questions before I get started. Particular stuff? No. OK. Yep, absolutely. Way in quorums. Yep. Um, that's a key part of the Open Meetings Act. Um, and I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Um, I want to just talk about first the, the basic philosophy of the Open Meetings Act is all meetings are public. And then we have a list of exceptions by which you can have a closed meeting. It's actually the same framework that the public records are. The basic concept is all government records are public records except for the following. And there's about 20 some or 27 <laughs> exceptions on the records as to what is public and not. But the basic idea is unless it fits into an exception, it's a public meeting. Unless it fits into an exception, it's a public record. On the public meetings, um, these apply to public bodies. And I just want to say public bodies are any of the formalized things, such as the zoning board, the planning board, the, uh, the harbor commission, the conservation commission, the council. Those are all public bodies. In addition to which, 
um, ad hoc committees, which are created from time to time, such as the street committee, or the meeting that didn't happen here tonight because we didn't have a quorum, the Land Use Procedural Improvements Committee. If it's an official ad hoc committee of the town, then it's a public body. Um, and if you think that's just, oh, that's a little tivoli and whatnot, now that goes all the way back, if you go all the way back in the federal government and the Clinton healthcare reform initiatives, and they set up a whole committee to write healthcare legislation, and they said, no, it didn't have to be public. And the United States Supreme Court disagreed with them and said, yes, they were a public body. They were working on this public issue made up of public officials, so they were a public body. So, um, also specifically, I don't know how many people would write, but the library, but the library trustees are public bodies too, um, here in Rhode Island. So, so as I said, the first basic thing is all public meetings are open unless they may be closed. And that means that people have the right to attend a meeting and they have the right to see and hear what happens at the meeting. Um, that means as far as see and hear, they have the right to have the meeting held in a building which is handicapped accessible. That's a requirement of the law. It's got to be accessible to people. You can't have a meeting in a place where it's not adequately accessible to people because, again, then they can't come and see and hear you. You've got to have either a setup in the room or microphones or something so that people can hear you. If it's set up so that they can never actually hear you, even if they come into the meeting and sit here and they can't hear what you're saying, that's not a valid public meeting either. Um, there is a difference between a public meeting and a public hearing. A public hearing is something where some aspect of the law, not the Open Meetings Act, but some other law provides a right for people to speak at that meeting. Now, examples of that would be zoning board meetings, public hearings. Certain planning board meetings are public hearings. With the council, liquor license application. That's a public hearing. And that gives people the right to actually come up and speak. But all the rest of this stuff in the Open Meetings Act does not give people an independent right to speak. All public hearings are public meetings, but not all public meetings are public hearings. So there is a distinction there. Now, also I want to mention the fact about meetings. Some people think that workshops are somehow exempt. Um, and they're not. There's no such thing as a public workshop that's not a public meeting anyway. No matter whether you call it a working session or a workshop or a charrette, um, if you've got a quorum of the public body and you're discussing this public business, <coughs> then you've got a meeting of that public body. And you need to have all the other things done. We talked about the notice and so forth. Um, and there's no meeting without a quorum. Although the one thing that a body can always do even without a quorum is they can convene the meeting and they can continue matters to another date. They can continue a meeting to a date certain, including public hearings. We've had that a lot over the past couple of months. <laughs> the last month with the snowstorms, town councils will have one town council member, haven't had to do it here, but um, have one town council member come open the meeting and then continue everything to a date certain so that you don't have to pay to re-advertise everything. Um, but that is the one thing that you can do without a quorum. Um, certain people think, oh, well, we can sit around and discuss everything as long as we don't take votes without a quorum. No, that's still a meeting. You're conducting the public's business. Maybe you didn't take a vote, but a lot of you are in advisory boards that you're not taking votes anyway. But if you're sitting around and talking about the public business, then you have to have a quorum in order to do that. So let's talk about this um, rolling quorum, the question that came up. Uh, what's a rolling quorum? Um, so it happens like this. The, the town administrator sends out a notice to the council members saying such and such an item is going to be on, you know, here's the, or here's the list, or it comes out from the clerk. 
and everybody sends in the clerk, here's the agenda for the upcoming meeting, and all the council members and a couple other staff people, including myself, are on the distribution list. And someone innocently replies all and says, wait a minute, I didn't think that Joe's supermarket was on the agenda this week. Didn't they get that resolved? And then someone else says, reply all. No, they didn't get it resolved. The violation's still there. They need to come here. All of a sudden, you've got a substantive discussion of public business by the public body out of sight of the public. That's what a violation of the ruling. That that that's that's part of the rolling quorum, and specifically the rolling quorum idea is well, all right, um, we've got four people. That's a quorum, so we're not going to get four people together. But two of us are going to get together and decide what we're going to do, and one of us will call a third person and talk to him, and he'll agree what he's going to do with us, and then we'll call a fourth person separately and talk to him, so that. All four people never talk to each other, never in the same room, never on the same phone call, never in the same email mail. But they've all had the same discussion. That's what a rolling quorum is. That's what's a violation of the Open Meetings Law. Any discussion of the substance of public business outside of the public view. And that's what's illegal. Um, so my advice, if you leave here with one thing, Go back to your computer, whichever one you use the most, your laptop, your desktop, home, work. Get a little sticky. Write the words reply well. Draw a circle around it and a big red line through that circle and the words reply well. Okay? That's the safest thing. Don't use your reply well button. It'll save you a lot of aggravation. It'll save you embarrassment sometimes too, but it will keep you from violating that. Don't reply well. If you've got a question, respond to the staff person. In that aspect, the thing is, the response should go to the clerk saying, I thought Joe's market wasn't on there. Let it go to the staff person rather than to everybody else. The same thing with your board. If it's a zoning board, send it back to Jody and say, Jody, what about this? If it's, if it's Harbors and Bruce's there, send an email to Bruce and say, what is it? But don't send it to all the members of the commission. Send it, if it's a planning board, send that email back to your know, planner or Kate, whoever it came from, but don't reply all, just send it to that one person and say that. Um, and that will protect you. So, yeah. so if you reply to less than the form, it's okay, is that what you're saying? Or no. Replying to anybody? I'm saying if you're replying to anybody about a substantive issue, it's a problem, other than your staff person. That's the way to do it. Keep it to the staff. And that does two things. One, it avoids that problem with, because you may not have, you probably have no control of the rolling quorum. You just reply to one other person, and then that person talks to someone else, and that person talks to someone else, and suddenly you've got the violation. Yeah, emails get forwarded, so it's best to keep it there. It also, we'll talk about ex parte communication later, it keeps it part of the official record. If there is a problem later, if there's a lawsuit later, <coughs> we've had these lawsuits here in town, and the subpoenas come in, and they want everything off the hard drive of the computer. They want all your email records and whatnot. Um, that's fine, because then it's there. You go to the staff person's thing, there's the email. There's the correspondence. It's legitimate if it's there. It can become part of the record. There was a question about it. Um, the only exception to this is scheduling. Sometimes you have to do it, okay, we need to set up a meeting. We need to do a site visit on Saturday, a Saturday. Who's available for the following Saturdays? And sometimes it's easier if you do a reply all so people can see who's available. But that's the only exception, just pure scheduling. Um, and I still recommend not doing it because it's so easy to slip into a substantive discussion in the course of the scheduling. Yes? What are you saying? I can't, I can't communicate with someone else on my board about something that we're going to eventually talk about um, at the open meeting? We can't discuss ahead of time? That is correct. You're not supposed to be discussing it ahead of time, um, the substance of the matter. If you're discussing the scheduling, yep, that's going to be on the next meeting. That's one thing. But you're not supposed to be discussing the substance. You're not supposed to be discussing the public's business out of your shot of the public. If it's not on the agenda at that time, can you discuss it with one of the board members? Then put it on the agenda? Well, or 
is that? <laughs> this is where we get to the yes and no, okay? And we also get to the fact that we live in a small town in a small state. So you run into people. You're in, the, you're, you're in Tom's Market. You're, you're down at the coffee shop, and someone says, what about that? Are we going to put that on the agenda? Are we going to talk about it? Um, so there's a certain interaction. It is not a violation of the Open Meetings Act if there's not a quorum involved, okay? Um, and in general, it's probably not a denial of due process, um, but I advise against it. This is where the no comes in, because it's just so easy to slip into a substantive discussion, you know, suddenly two out of five of the members have pretty much made up their mind on an issue because they've been talking about it. Um, so I, I think you have to watch that very carefully. Um, and if you start talking about substantive stuff, say, well, you know, we should leave that. We should, that's what your response should be. We should put that on an agenda and discuss it at the meeting. That's, that's the way to go. Yes, Steve. Um, yes, the, the, well, again, yes and no, but more yes. The, the ex officio members who are like yourself, if you're staff to a certain committee, that's correct. You can be providing information, but you shouldn't be discussing it with the members, um, you know, for example, the street committee. You're going to provide background information. Here's copies of deeds. Here's copies of records. Here's what we've done. You shouldn't be including, you shouldn't be getting into any discussions, talking to people on the committee and so forth about it. You should be sending that out. And again, the, the reason is because that's now public when we get into public record. That thing that you send out will be a public record so that anybody will be able to see it. If you just have a phone call with someone and talk to them for half an hour about your thoughts about a particular street, the public doesn't know about it. They don't know what your ideas were, whether, yeah, that's a good idea, or he's crazy. They have no way to know about it, rebut it, support it. So you want to avoid those conversations. I mean, even if you have two staff on the same committee as ad hoc members, can they discuss things? Um, yes. Yes, they can. I mean, because that's, you're not a public body there. I mean, we do have meetings of only staff people in town and so forth, and then you're not a public body. Um, you do obviously have to do some preparation for things ahead of time. So that is okay. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. All right, for instance, if I was to notice something in town, I, obviously I'm not going to contact other members, but when I'm, if I'm contacting the, say, a town administrator, mm -hmm. he spreads the word, that has to end the conversation? Or would, I mean, if we're contacting through the administrator, are we covered? Yes. Yeah, I mean, right. You see something that's bothering you as you're driving through town, you would contact the administrator. And if the administrator didn't do something to your satisfaction, you want to discuss it further, that's when you want to submit an agenda request and say, I want to discuss it at the council meeting. I'm just, so. I'm just saying, as far as conversation, if it was an issue that was kind of burning and it was coming up <laughs> with the next agenda, how can we communicate are we not supposed to communicate that's, at all that's even if you're through the administrator still okay. not conversations yeah that's that's correct if it's if this is a burning issue but it's coming up on the next agenda you're not really supposed to be communicating on the substance of it um, with you certainly with your fellow counselors you're not supposed to be talking about it um, and as far as the administrator, you're providing information. And if you, again, I, we'll talk about this. If you want to get information to your fellow counselors, send it to the clerk. Same thing with the other bodies. And if you get that email and so forth, send it to the staff person so it gets in the record and then it can be distributed to everybody. And then you don't have what we call ex parte communication, ex parte outside the scope of it, the private conversation. So now, as I said, I know there are always sometimes you're going to run into people. You're going to come into town hall. You're going to say, hello, you know what I saw down on Main Street? You know, so things are going to happen. I'm not going to say that it's 100% <laughs> perfect. But as a goal, that's your goal, not to be talking about the business, and particularly if it's already on an agenda, if it's coming up, if it's already being dealt with, not to be talking about it ahead of time. So, the, so let's say I, I, I brainstormed something that I wanted to 
introduce to my um, rest of the people on my board. Can I send them a copy of that ahead of time so they can read it and look at it, and then we have a discuss discussion when we get there? Yes. That, that's okay. Yes, but, but that, that, that becomes public. Okay. So if you yeah. send something out to your board, yeah. um, and either, for example, if it's about a specific issue before you, a specific person before you, you should be providing them with a copy of it. And it certainly should be available to someone saying, I want to see what's, they, you know, someone should have the right to see that before the meeting as well. Okay, so, so. so that's when you mean send it to the clerk and the yes. clerk. Exactly. Right, yeah, and I understand some of you don't have clerks, it's just the chairman or the secretary of the board who's doing it, but that's the point. Then it becomes an, a public record and then it's, there's nothing underhanded about it. So you're not talking the town clerk? I'm not no, the no, not the town clerk, okay. no. No, and I understand. Well, you're the chairman or, or the secretary of the board, you know, your board, that's fine. But just, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with a particular individual that's before you and you're going to be sending it, send it to that individual, too. So then there can't be any question. They have an opportunity to see it. We talk about that, too, with, like, draft decisions. Um, to the extent the planning board or whatnot is using draft decisions, send it to the opposing council at the same time you're sending it to the members so they see it. It's not a behind the scenes thing, it's up front. It's not that you can't do these things, it's that you can't do them hidden, out of sight of the public. So the idea of saying, brainstorming between two people on the same committee, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't really be doing that except in a public meeting, right. Okay. And a quorum for the four group is? It's a majority of the group. Okay. So. That's, um, other than the zoning board, which has specific, got to have at least five, um, and there are certain requirements for decision of the planning board, but um, generally for everybody else, it's a majority of the group. Yes? If those two members were assigned by their board or commission yes. to do that, to brainstorm and come back with an idea, that's okay, though. As yes. long as the board and commission knows you were doing, am I correct, and you were appointed yeah. by them, like, if... I've done it before. Ask mm -hmm. them, go and speak to the people and get a plan to bring back to us. Yes, you can do that with less than a quorum. You can, if it's, again, if it's officially set forth, saying, okay, we're appointing these two people as a subcommittee mm -hmm. to, to go and get this information. And then <laughs> gets a little bit confusing if you're actually going to be, like, having any kind of hearings or meetings of your subcommittee, then you have to right. post it. But if it's two people and you're just asked, Come up with come up with a draft policy, then that's fine. You can you can do that policy. You can work on it together. But, if you, but introduce, if you introduce an idea, then it needs to be discussed. Needs to be discussed. It needs to be public. You shouldn't be working on. Hey, I got a great idea for a draft policy. Let's do it beforehand. It should come up at the meeting and say, okay, yes, we as a body think that's a good idea. Let's have that. That why don't you to work on it and come back with the policy. So we need to have a discussion before we vote on whether. Yes, if you're going if you're going to be collaborating on it, if you're not if you're going to be doing it individually, you don't have to. Okay. But if you're going to be collaborating on it, you need to have that vote ahead of time so the public knows about it. So when the public sees you off in the corner of the coffee shop with the, all the stuff spread around and the laptop, and you're working on it, they have the ability to find out that you're you're officially doing it. You're not violating the law by having a secret little meeting to the to establish policy in private. So everything should be discussed. It can't be, one member can't just say that they don't want to discuss it. It needs to be well, if, brought up at a Well, if it's, if it's on the agenda, and unless, you know, if someone doesn't want to discuss it, then the proper thing is a motion to table. And if a majority of the group agree that it should be tabled, then it doesn't get discussed. Thank you. So. Just a question about sure. Um, so, for example, if it's five, mm -hmm. and there's only three people there or four people there, just what's the difference? Okay, well, you're, you're kind of getting into parliamentary procedure versus that. The quorum is going to be three. If there are five members of the board, a quorum is three. Okay. So if there are three people there, then you have a meeting. Now, in most circumstances, then you could have a two-to-one vote and something would pass. 
even though it's not a real majority, but unless there's some requirement, you know, as I said, zoning boards are different, planning boards are a little different, but everybody else, it's, that's the way it's going to be. So. And just so you have it, if you've got an even number, and you have a vote, and it's a tie, then the motion fails. So. Okay. Um, I will just tell you, um, social gatherings are okay, so long as no business is discussed. Um, and there's actually an opinion on this. There was a there was a Christmas party over in Bristol with all the members of the town council attending, and someone filed a complaint about it. And um, he said, no, it's okay to have a social gathering where you have a quorum of your board. But I want to say something here, and you have to watch the appearance, as I mentioned in the materials. There's a big difference between a cocktail party with 50 people and seven town councilors circulating around it. Um, as opposed to a 10-person dinner party with five town councilors at it. Um, so you need to be sensitive to what that is. And even in public stuff, uh, public meetings, and, and I've had this discussion, um, like when town council members go to planning board meetings or zoning board meetings, and I say, don't all sit together, okay? You can be there, all seven of you can be in the room, don't all sit together, spread out, so that there's not a perception that you're there having your own meeting unannounced while you're attending someone else's meeting. And I would say the same thing if it's a social thing. You know, if you, if you're all, you know, if if a couple of you, if two of you are in a restaurant and the third one comes along, don't be polite and say, "Yeah, please join us." If you got your five member board. So, good to see you, so forth, and the third person shouldn't sit down with the other two and create the quorum there. Go on off to another table, sit on the other side of the restaurant. Be sensitive to what that appearance is, because someone else will come in, someone who will have no idea that all three of you came in separately at different ten minute intervals and happened to sit down together. Someone else will just walk in and see three members of a five member board sitting together on a table and think, hmm, what are they doing there? How come I don't know about it? What, what, are they, what are they cooking up? So you, and that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid that attitude of people thinking, well, what are you cooking up? Whether you're cooking up something or not. So, um, minutes, everybody is supposed to, every public body is supposed to keep minutes. Um, everybody keeps different degrees of minutes of how detailed they are. Um, for most of you, they don't have to be verbatim records of what happened. They can be just the discussion. Key things are where and when, who was there, and don't just say all members were in attendance. List the names of everybody in attendance. Um, and if you have any votes, that's important. And then the gist of it. If there was discussion, you know, it doesn't have to give every point of the discussion. It can. Some, some bodies like that. They like to have all the details and uh, be able to read it back later and see what all the various issues were, but it doesn't have to. It can be, you know, a vigorous debate ensued. As long as you make sure that you have the details if there are any motion that followed it <coughs> and who made the motion and who seconded it. And if somebody leaves during the meeting or somebody comes in late, you want to note that so that if there's a you know, later thing and it says the vote is unanimous, well, yeah, there were five people who came in, but two people left early, and it was really only the three that were left that were voting unanimously at the end. That needs to all be visible. That's something in the law that you need to have available. And then it should be available within 35 days of the meeting or the next regularly scheduled meeting, whichever is earlier. And that's a goal that, frankly, sometimes is just impossible. You know, you have a... <laughs> You have a meeting, your next meeting is a week later or two weeks later, um, you're just not going to necessarily have that done. The important thing is, if you have your minutes done, even though they haven't been approved, those, I'm jumping ahead in a way to public records, but those are public records. If you got your minutes done, then that's a public document. You can stamp them draft or unofficial. Um, or use a watermark that has that. Uh, if you're printing it out on your computer, big, huge, underlined thing that says draft, that's fine. But they are, they should be available to the public if someone wants them. You can't use the excuse of saying, no, they haven't been approved yet at the meeting. 
they if they're done, they are available. They're public records. Andy, are we are we posting those draft minutes to the state? No. No, we don't post m our minutes to the state anyway. It's only state agencies that have to post their minutes. The town agencies only have to post their agendas. We don't have to post our minutes. So we are not posting our minutes on the state. We are posting some of our minutes on the town clerk base. Am I correct? We post them all on the town clerk base. Okay. okay. We post on the state. We post on the The agendas. You have to post the notices. Well, first of all, I would say, yeah, I would say wait until you've approved them to post them. Okay. Because otherwise people aren't going to find that. I mean, they're going to have to keep looking at a whole series. If you make changes and then approve them, the, the real correct way there would then be to post the corrected minutes. If you just have to go to continually read the next week's minutes to know if there was changes, that's very confusing. So I either wait till they're approved to post them or post corrected minutes. And as I said, it's, it's not a legal requirement that you have to post them in the state. You can, and it's great. It makes it easier to find, um, but it's not a legal requirement. And I, you know, I feel that more people are most more likely to look for town records on the town website through the clerk-based system than they are in the state system. So just to be clear, so if a board of committee is meeting once a month, yes, we're approving the minutes a month later. Yes. Beyond that. Well, you have 30 days or 35 days or your next regularly scheduled meeting. So if you're meeting once a month, you're probably pretty close to the 35 days. Close is good. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, right. And, and I'm, I, you know, I, I've never seen, I've never seen any complaint on this for short violations like that on the minutes. When the complaints come is when it's six months later and there's no minutes. And that's harder to justify. So um, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't worry about a couple of days here or there. Andy, most of them put them on the website too anyway, but what about the documentation from a public meeting? If I went to the um, economic development and submitted documents, mm -hmm. how does the general public get to see those documents unless they're somehow part of a kept record that I could say well I want to go back and see last year so-and-so presented something I mean is it necessary to keep the document once you, once it's presented it's public right and it should be kept it should be kept with the records whether it's in the vault downstairs whether it's in the vault or downstairs or in the file cabinet for that particular board or commission if things are presented at a public meeting um, there should be at least one copy of that kept as a record so that someone could come in, they look at the minutes, minutes and they read the minutes and they see that Joe Smith came in and presented copies of some various tables and graphs. They should be able to then make a request for public records and say, I'd like to see those tables and graphs that were submitted on April 13, 2012. That's correct. It should still be available. It should be available. If it's so presented at a public meeting. Matching room. that to what I sent to the, the town clerk. I don't think you, well, I mean, you well, can. I keep it myself. I think you keep it yourself, and it's got to go to the next, you know, your successor and so forth. It's got to be part of the official records of the town, because that's what it is. It's a public record. It needs to be available to someone. Now, you know, sometimes it's the easiest way to do it. Sometimes the easiest way is to attach it to the minutes as an exhibit to the minutes and then then it's done and then it's easier to see um, but sometimes that maybe get vol voluminous sometimes of it's large scale plans that you can't reduce um, there are other issues why that may not be feasible but some of the minor ones like letters from someone that has written in to say yeah because those all boards and commission minutes are scanned in and put on clerk base as well so yeah. really 
they're all on the website. Well, but I, but I think you have to be consistent. You don't want to be picking and choosing whose letters get attached to the minutes to go on clerk base. Either you're going to take all letters that come in and attach them and they go on clerk base or none. You shouldn't be picking and choosing who's, who's go up there. Right, but it doesn't have to go on the clerk base with the minutes. It has to be available. And it has to be referenced in the minutes so that someone can know, can know they exist. There must be a lot of documents in people's names. <laughs> there, there, there probably are, and that's why we're having this tonight. For those of you who've got those boxes under your dining room table or back, you know, the TV is sitting on a couple of boxes worth of papers from a decade's worth of records, um, get them to the clerk. Get them to the keeper of the records. Um, they, they, those are public documents. So unless you're using them, um, I'm serious about that. Get them to the town, get them to the town clerk. Those are public records. And, and I know that's what we've got. We've got volunteers and you do it and keep it at home. And you know, I do the same thing, um, not with the towns I represent, but I'm on some nonprofit private organizations. Um, it's not a public document, but again, you know, I have my own records and you know, they make sure when I leave the board that I hand them back and don't keep them. So. Okay. Um, as I said before, basic concept, all meetings are open unless they fall into certain exceptions that they can be closed. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because most of you don't have any reason to close your meetings. Most, other than the town council, most of the rest of you don't have valid reasons to have um, closed meetings. Um, other than, well, I'm not talking about the school committee, but um, the, um, the juvenile hearing board is kind of the opposite of everything there, but that's a specialized thing where those records are closed to protect them. Um, but for the rest of you, um, just a quick overview. The reasons you can close a meeting are discussion of job performance, character, physical and mental health of a person or persons. Um, and I note that this refers to a person, not just an employee. So it can be a prospective employee. So if a body's looking at prospective employees, so they get the personnel board, um, that's a good reason to have it kept closed. Um, the important thing to remember, though, is if you're using this, um, the person you're talking about has the right to have it in open session. Um, if they want to have it out in the open, they have that right. And you have to notify them in writing that they have that right. Give you the example. Town across the bay. Town council is talking about getting rid of their town manager. The town manager knows it. They, they've been going their separate ways. He knows that's what they're meeting for. He comes into the town hall because he's got the keys. He unlocks the town hall, turns on the light and the heat, and turns off the alarm. Council comes in. Town solicitor is there and says to the town manager, do you want to you be present? you want to be in the meeting? Says, no, let him talk about me. That's fine. I'm here in my office. If you need me, come and get me. So no question had actual knowledge that this was going on. But he didn't have a piece of paper that informed him that it was going on and that he had the right to have it in public. Um, he was notified of all that stuff. And in fact, the town manager didn't complain. He didn't file the complaint. But some citizen filed a complaint. The attorney general upheld the complaint. The town council had to go through the whole process all over again um, since that meeting was held to be invalid without the notice. So it's got to be written notice. So for those of you, such as the person on board, and obviously Nancy's got a little, but Nancy's got a nice little form. Now, I will tell you, Nancy's form has a little thing for the person who's notified to sign and acknowledge it and check whether they want it public or private, which is good. Because 95, 99% of the time they sign it and they check the box and then you have a record of that. But legally, it's not required that they respond. If you give it to someone and they don't give it back to you, it doesn't matter. The law requires that you hand them the notice. The law doesn't require that they hand the notice back to you. So, 
separate little thing there. Um, sessions pertaining to collective bargaining, litigation, um, those are the usual, those are the most common. Security is also obviously a big deal these days. We often have security things where it um, needs to be closed, investigative proceedings, um, things like that. Um, and actually one um, which hopefully is relevant here in town, which is any discussion of personal finances of a prospective donor to a library. So I hope you have lots of donors coming before you. You can meet in closed executive session to discuss, is he really good? How much can we ask him for? How much money does he make and have, and how much do we ask him for? Only 50,000, we ask him for 100,000. You can have those meetings in closed executive session. So um, when we get out of executive session, um, you must inform the public of whether you took action on any of the items that you did in executive session. You don't have to tell them what the action was, but you have to tell them whether you took action on it. Um, then beyond that, depending on the particular action, and it gets into probably too many permutations to talk about now tonight, um, you may be saying, okay, we did this in executive session and actually announce what you did. Um, and then you have the ability to, if you want, to seal the records, to seal the minutes of the executive session. Because you can do and say, okay, we were in executive session and we were discussing donors to the library and we're pleased to announce that Mr. Smith has donated $50,000 to the library. You still might want to say, move to seal the minutes so that you don't have all the detailed discussion about how much money Mr. Smith was actually good for um, available. That's not sort of thing you want in public, particularly if you're going to be asking more money, whatever, those sort of things. So you can seal the minutes. Um, and that's how you do it with a motion to seal the minutes. Yes? Would that be at the subsequent meeting when the minutes are reviewed? Um, no, you do it right when you come out of executive session so that those minutes don't even become public. Those, now, um, a lot of times those minutes get approved just they're provided to the members. They look at them, there's just a vote to approve the minutes. If there's any discussion about minutes from an executive session, you need to have another executive session to have that discussion in it. So. And obviously, you're another example of where you're discussing buying property and so forth that you would seal the minutes up until the time. What we've tried to do is after the property is bought, then we make the records public. Um, although we usually don't make the minutes of open space, the minutes of the discussion public, because the minutes are often more far ranging, talking about, okay, we want to get this property here, A, and then we're going to go for B and C. And just because you bought property A, you don't want B and C to know you're still looking at their property. Um, so those are the kind of minutes that would not necessarily ever become public, or not for a long time. Questions? Other questions about that? Um, Andy? Yes. If, if at some point in time, the purchase was made and the land becomes open space, mm -hmm. so the conversation surrounding that in executive session, it's a, it's a completed activity. Mm -hmm. It might be two or three years afterwards. What do you do with those minutes when you unseal them? Where do they go? Do they have to be delivered to some place, or do they just become part of your collection of minutes? Well, they, yeah, they should be. When, they, when you unseal them, and, um, you know, it's a good idea. You know, it's probably a good idea to try to do that, to every year look back, you know, let's look at the minutes from three years ago and see what could be unsealed. If you're keeping your minutes, that's fine. Or when you unseal them, if you're sending your regular minutes as you know to be posted with the town send those unsealed ones as well to be posted on clerk base uh, or again get them to the town clerk so that she's got the real permanent archives and records so that you know two things 50 years from now when there's some dispute about where the property boundary is or something like that um, these records may be available um, and also for future historians 
I have a real worry that we're doing so much electronically, there's not going to be anything, any original sources for them to be examining. So at least let's try to do the things that we've historically done, like land evidence records and land stuff, and keep that so that someone 100 years from now or 200 years from now can dig around and figure out what we were doing. So. Um, often the question comes up about adding something to an agenda. We didn't, we didn't add it to the agenda. Um, can we still talk about it? How do we add something to the agenda? Um, and I just want to preface this by saying school committees are differ different, and they have stricter requirements about what they can add to their agendas. But for everybody else, a public body can add something to its an agenda, agenda by a majority vote of the members. So that's the easy part. Then the second part is what you can do with that item you've added. And it can only be for informational purposes only, and it can't be voted on except if it's to um, refer it to an appropriate committee or another body for action. You can do that. You can refer it to someone. You can discuss it and refer it. Or it's necessary to address an unexpected occurrence that requires immediate action to protect the public. So that's a three-part test. It's got to be unexpected. It can't be something that you've known is coming for six months and you've now finally decided you're going to deal with it. That's not an emergency that justifies it. Um, it's got to be something that requires that immediate action. It can't wait to your next meeting. Um, and it needs to protect the public. Um, and those are few and far between. In my career, I've had very few of those um, of those things. Uh, probably about one a decade um, where it's where it's come up. Now that's not to say emergency meetings are different where a body might hold an emergency meeting and provide notice and agenda and so forth, and they're meeting in less than 48 hours notice because of an emergency coming up. That's a little bit different. But this is where you're at a meeting and you're going to add it right then and there and vote right then and there. No one's seen it before you decided to do it there. That's very rare. So at the end of every meeting, you should be discussing as a group what's going to be on the next agenda? Um, well, that's, that's one way to do it. I mean, that, that's up to each group. Some groups, it's, you know, the secretary that sets the agenda. Some groups, it's the staff based on the applicant. Sometimes it's the clerk. Sometimes it's joint. It's the clerk and the administrator and the, the president and the body. That, but that's also how some, even some town councils do that. At the end of the town council meeting, they have a discussion about what's going to be on the agenda. Now, that's part of what's on the agenda, and actually that happens here, actually with the council prerogatives. Council members raise things and um, with their announcements, items, and whatnot, they're often raising items that they want to see on the next agenda. It doesn't mean it'll be limited to that. Other people will add it, but that's a good way to get things that people want to have on the future agendas. So I think we're going to take um, a, just a quick five minute break, let everybody walk around, bathroom break, water, soda, sugar, whatever, stretch your legs, and we'll come back in just five minutes, okay?